mm. see Pat Beverly, Trez, and, and Sweet Lou. <laughs> Sweet Lou to the rescue. The Raptors should have the edge. They have the home court advantage. They are the healthier team. And they have the guy that I think most people believe is the best player in the series, in Kawhi. This, this has gone from bad to worse. Yes. And, and again, to save LeBron, it needs to be Ty Lue because it seems like that's the only way LeBron's going to be able to function as LeBron. Chris Broussard here, and welcome to the brand new Hoops on Fox podcast. This podcast will give you your daily dose of all things NBA from Fox Sports, including the best content from Skip and Shannon, Nick Wright, plus special guests, fresh NBA content from myself, post-game interviews from NBA stars around the league, and much, much more. Up first, Rick Buecher joins Skip and Shannon to break down the rumor of Jason Kidd to the Lakers. Rick, ultimately, who will have the final say on the Lakers coaching decision? Ultimately, it'll be Jeannie Buss. She's at the mm -hmm. top of the hierarchy. Now, the people that are that have dogs in this race for the next coach tell me it's not exactly clear who is making the ultimate basketball decisions. Uh -huh. The hierarchy right now, as I understand it, and was had confirmed this morning, is Rob, Kurt, and Linda Rambis, mm -hmm. and then Jeannie Buss. <laughs> wow. So that's the hierarchy. Ultimately, who makes the decision, we'll, we'll see. Huh. So is it possible that very <laughs> quietly and unofficially that Kurt Rambis has effectively replaced Magic Johnson as the sort of president, whatever that capacity is, of the Lakers? By his association with Linda? Yeah. I mean, I'm told Linda really is holds the keys to the really? kingdom now. She has been afforded that what? by G. Okay, I'm, I'm okay and, and for the record, <laughs> she's very close to G. Yes. Close. yes. And she already has an executive status with the franchise. Yes. I don't know exactly what her title or role is. But she's Jeannie's Gate, number one gatekeeper, gatekeeper. I think is now. She's number one confidant. Yes. Okay. Obviously, Kurt is still very close to Phil Jackson, who came back for a practice and sat with Kurt watching from above. So is it possible that somehow Phil is back in the, the, the loop here as, as far as input, like some telephone input? Well, Jeannie has always counted sure. on his counsel. Yeah. So that, that's never changed. But in terms of him coming in and having some sort of formal yeah. effect on things, I would say no. And that goes for the same with Jerry West and Pat Riley and all the other names that we've mm. heard. If you're looking for one of those previous knights in shining armor to come uh, riding to the, the rescue, that, that, that is not going to happen. What you are seeing now is most likely going to be what the hierarchy is going mm. to be. So quick point on Kurt Rambis. I know him pretty well from days at ESPN. You've been around him a lot over the many years. I, I respect his basketball IQ and vision. He's not magic in charisma or, you know, he's he's the unmagic actually. So d d would you trust his perspective, his input? W would it be um, w would it be capable of, of, of having that sort of, Jerry West effect. He's not Jerry West, obviously, but does he have some of that in him? Yeah, I, I'm his his basketball acumen. I'm not concerned about. You know? where the Lakers are is it's about the relationships they have around the league and being able to dig out the talent that they need mm -hmm. to upgrade this roster. That's ultimately what it comes down to. And Kurt, for as long as he's been in the league hasn't been in one of those places where he's had to make those decisions. Right. He's had to make those right. connections. So it's a matter of who ultimately is going to do the work. Mm. There's a lot of work to be done. We keep looking at the names and all of that. Even if you brought a Jerry West or a Pat Riley in, they would bring the, the panache that you need, sure. right? But ultimately, it's going to be the worker bees that are going to turn this, and that's the bigger question. Mm. I see you shaking your head over there. LeBron James said, this is what I signed <laughs> I up for. Oh, by the way, saying. by the way, your man is not happy right now. Oh. I know! I know! He said, I left this function in Cleveland. He did. When all of a sudden, before a week before free agency, a couple of days before free agency, you fired David Griffin. He said, I thought I left that. He said, I, I thought I was coming to L.A. for stability, a pillar, a bedrock foundation mm -hmm. in the NBA. And this is what I get? I get chaos? Yeah. By the way, uh, when it comes to Jason Kidd and, and Monty Williams and Ty Lue, and Ty Lue my understanding is, is Monty Williams has a very good shot. Really? I've even, somebody even told me pole position in this because it really? would be an appeasement to clutch agency. The concern is with Ty Lue coming in, you still have a lot of young players on that roster. Right. And the LeBron effect of LeBron gets everything he wants and we're just here and we got to go Sorry. along with it. 
bringing Ty Lu would only double down really? on that feeling. Monty Williams is 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 a clutch guy, yeah. but at the same time, he's a young new coach where they could look at that and go, oh, okay, maybe we have an opportunity to earn his respect and trust. Right. And there's opposed- another another clutch guy we trying to recruit too. That is true. Well, well, you we- know that clutch guy, Rick. <laughs> and and would AD prefer Monty? Does would he would a- uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't be opposed to that, okay. but. I mean, let's not talk about AD right now because that that ship is so far on soon. the horizon that uh. this is ridiculous. Skip, look, Jeannie, this is not a mom and pop's convenience store. It's feeling like you it. don't get your your first cousin and, and and your brother's girlfriend and all this to run this, Doctor Butt. Skip, there is a reason. If you mm-hmm. notice, Dr. Buss didn't have any of his kids when he was running the organization mm-hmm. making any decisions. Jeannie was in charge of well, marketing. Well, they were just kids. They were no, no they weren't kids. Well, well, they were. No, they weren't kids. No, 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 no. I mean, when he first When he, when he passed away, they oh, were no, not no, kids. Oh, no, no, not when he passed away. The flip side of this is, is when Jim came in, Jim didn't do it like his dad. Mm-hmm. He went out. He got a Mike Brown. He got a Mike D'Antoni. He got people outside of yeah. the Lakers yes. family. Good point. And that didn't work. So Jeannie is saying... That didn't work. I'm going to go back to the way my dad did it, mm-hmm. which was more inclusive. Now, happened mm-hmm. to be inclusive with people that were in their prime and had championship pedigrees. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Now you're dealing with how do we make it inclusive, people that I trust, people that I know, but they, haven't approved, they mm-hmm. don't have a proven track record. Mm-hmm. So do you realize that Rick Buecher just told us that Linda Rambus has become a primary decision maker for the Los Angeles Lakers featuring LeBron James? I'm out. You're out? I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Until until this thing is resolved, Linda until, until they can give me something concrete that I, that I can that I can hang my hat on. That might be the most disappointing thing, because I just signed on with you guys and I was expecting more uh-huh. of this. I can't uh-huh. have you. Uh-huh. I can't uh-huh. have you out. Uh-huh. We gotta bring you back. No, uh-huh. You gotta uh-huh. find a way. Skip, this is, Skip, so, now so, you know this is unacceptable. I, I don't know much, if anything, about Linda. Do you know much at all? I don't. You, okay. Well, there we go. So Rick Buecher, an authority, knows very little about the newest authority of the Lakers. Really? Look, I know Linda Carter. She was Wonder Woman. Yeah, I know Linda was. Ronstadt. Yeah. I don't know Linda Rambus. But if she's going to be making... Look, I'm going to love Linda Rambus. If she can deliver us KD, Linda AD, Rambus. Kyrie, or something I, of I wonder, value. I wonder if LeBron knows Linda at all. No. Like... Would he have any feel for her or no? Because that's not what he signed up for. But uh, to be fair, Linda is not in the meetings. Le- Linda has ceded that to Kurt. So okay. I <gasps> will trust. I will at least. It's funny. I will at worse? least trust. Wow. I will trust somebody who at least knows what they don't know. Hey, can I? Can I do? Can I do what I'm gonna do? In morning meetings, I'm gonna send somebody in there for me. <laughs> I'm you? gonna stay in my A dressing proxy? room. Yeah, I'm gonna, stay, I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay in my dressing room, really? and then you know I'm gonna send them to the meeting, and then they are gonna come back and give me the information that you got. Well, that would give you more time to post on IG, right? <laughs> Post Rick, breakfast. Rick, you know this is not a good sign, Rick. Yeah. You up here laughing, but it's not funny. This was a proud franchise. Hadn't been to the playoffs in six years. Yeah. And it seems like more gloom and doom is on the horizon. LeBron didn't sign up for this. We go into year 17, we came to stack trophies. Mm. And I don't know if we're going to be able to stack anything. Stack them? Yes. Two. More than one. <laughs> I, hey, th- this is... This, this has gone from bad to worse. Yes. And, and again, to save LeBron, it needs to be Ty Lue because it seems like that's the only way LeBron's going to be able to function as LeBron. Get right? us a superstar, we're going to get us a trophy. Hmm. Get us a superstar, we'll get us a trophy. Well, like that? Like, like that. Okay. And? I get us a Because if, if, if KD comes here, that's a no-brainer. But if KD leaves Golden State mm-hmm. and you get us a superstar to go with LeBron, oh, yeah, we, we going. We getting us a chip. Mm. Well, last time you were here, you said the the eye on the prize is the number two wow. guy up in Toronto. And you saw him last. Did you see him last night? Against Orlando. That, did I you did. see him? Yeah. <laughs> I saw Siakam last night, too. Wow. Claw. Yep. Can you imagine Claw and Braun uh, together? It's, it's still not enough. For a championship team, if it's I, I would if agree K, with that. If I'm KD leaves Golden State, that's more than enough. It does crack you, the door open. This is what I appreciate. You're back in. You're back in. No, we we gonna get Kawhi. Back in. We get Kawhi. I think you're gonna get Kemba. Oh, oh, we must ride to get Kawhi and Kemba. What if Kawhi Say wants to go enough. to the other LA team, though, huh? what if Kawhi wants to go to that other? Mm. LA? You don't want that. Are you sure? Mm. Look, you look. I, I, well, what the if? Wait a second. What if Linda Rambus wants Jimmy Butler? I don't I know. Linda, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that, Linda.
Linda doesn't know what she's in for from this. <laughs> she table. No, <laughs> hey, hey, Linda, you know, I'm sorry now. I just want you to know what comes with the territory. I don't have a problem with promoting and, and women's rights, but you're going to get criticized up in here. Mm -hmm. So don't think because you're a woman getting a man in a no. man's role. No, no, that ain't how we do business up here. Because mm. I'm going to criticize you come with some bunk. Mm. So go and get me Kawhi and Kimba, and Linda, I'm going to love you for the rest of your life. Mm. And life will be good? Yeah. Hmm. It'll be championships. Okay. What you gonna say then, Skip? Whew, the Kimba and Kawhi and LeBron? I, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Vincent Goodwill joins Nick and CeCe to dissect the Raptors 76ers second round matchup. Both teams don't strike you with a whole lot of confidence that they can seize opportunities in front of them. Toronto gave up a game, the opening game where Kyle Lowry went scoreless. You can't mm -hmm. have your third best player, your franchise mainstay, mm -hmm. perform that way. Philly dropped their first game, but basically dominated the rest of the series. What I will say is, CeCe, I think this is a Jimmy Butler series. If you're okay. Philadelphia, right. Jimmy Butler is going to go head up against Kawhi Leonard. He measured himself. I covered Jimmy Butler for years in Chicago. When he was starting to come up and get notoriety as a star, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George were the two guys that he was, that was the mark on his board. Okay, yes. So this is one of those series. And those two guys worked out together in San Diego. They were Jordan Brand guys, all that type of stuff. So I'm very curious to see if he's going to emerge from the shadows. He allowed Simmons and Embiid and Tobias Harris to take more of a front-facing role mm -hmm. in this previous series. But going up against the counterpart, that's, that's going to be hard for him to stay in the background. And I'm very curious to see if he's going to be the difference. If they win, he's going to be the difference more so than Simmons and Embiid. Well, I, I do like the point as far as that knowing the history there, because that is right. Jimmy Butler from when he started to emerge in the Eastern Conference with the Bulls, he was always compared to Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Yep. All three of them. Then he started to improve his jump shot. Then mm -hmm. you can start to say, wow, Jimmy Butler's one of the elite players that we have. I believe he'll play an important role. I don't believe that he matches up with Kawhi. I believe Kawhi will be able to get him into foul trouble. So I believe they'll have a rotation as far as the Sixers on Kawhi compared to just predominantly it being Jimmy Butler. Tobias Harris, he plays a key role because mm -hmm. he provides some more length. I believe the edge goes to Toronto, not only having the home court, Joel Embiid is not 100%. No. And I believe that they can wear him down more and more because the second round and the pressure of the playoffs for Joel to, Joel to be able to perform the way he did, I believe that gets him out of sync in that offense because when he's dominating the ball, he's a great player. Their offense, it's hard for Jimmy Butler. It's harder for Ben Simmons. So how do they work that out in probably the most pressure situation they'll be in in the second round matchup with the Raptors, Nick? The Raptors should have the edge. They have the home court advantage. They are the healthier team. And they have the guy that I think most people believe is the best player in the series in Kawhi. Embiid's great. But, and, but even Embiid at 100% is not yet what Kawhi Leonard is and what Kawhi Leonard's been every year of his career, except for last year mm -hmm. when he was hurt and didn't didn't play. So they should have the edge. If Philly is going to be able to not only make this a series but win the series, the point you made, I'm in 100% lockstep on, which is Jimmy Butler, he can't play Kawhi to a push but have it be close. Mm -hmm. Have Jimmy Butler give you 75 to 80% of what Kawhi is giving Toronto. The other element, though, I'm going to put on the shoulders of Brett Brown. You want Joel Embiid to play every game in this series. How can you get the Ben Simmons that has shown up when Joel has not played in games with Joel Embiid. When you have a short bench as well, does that mean you bring either Joel or Ben off the court earlier than usual so one of those guys is on the court with a second unit so you don't – because. You, they could go to die in these series at the end of the first quarter into the third quarter. They could play. Philly could play Toronto even for 42 minutes of the game, but the last three minutes of the first, last three minutes of the third, when the subs come in, Toronto could beat them by 18 in those stretches and win, these, and win the series based on that. Can Brett Brown, does he have a plan? Has he been planning for this series since the bracket's been set? Because he should have been. Because we knew Toronto was going to beat Orlando, and if Philly couldn't get past Brooklyn, despite how game one went, it would have been a travesty. So ha does Brett Brown have a new wrinkle, a new rotation ready for this series? I don't even know if it comes down to that. I think coaching, especially in the NBA, is more about people management than X's and O's. And I think for years during that process, there was less people management than anything else. 
And do you have the heart, do you have the gumption to tell Joel Embiid, you're going against Mark Gasol, don't make this a Damian Lillard, Russell Westbrook situation where you mm-hmm. want to outplay him. That may, this may not be his series for him to score 25, 30 points a night. This may be a series for him to be rim protector, rebounder, defender, mm. screener, opportunistic scorer because you have enough of that in Ben Simmons when he's aggressive, in Jimmy Butler, in Tobias Harris when you mm-hmm. feature him. But will, J- will Joel Embiid listen to that? Will he be amenable to that? Or will he say, look, I want to get us to the conference finals. I want to be the guy to take us there. And not as an ego thing, but as a I'm first team NBA center. I'm 26, 13, and 3. Like, mm-hmm. I, let me live up to that. But this may not be his series. CC, so how much does the second round of the playoffs come down to, you know, Joel Embiid and Kawhi Leonard going out there and leading their team and going out there and playing basketball the way they know how to play with their units? And how much is it going to come down to what we see from Nick Nurse and what he does with the depth for Toronto and what we see from Brett Brown and what he does with the rotation of maybe Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid? How much does coaching factor into a game like this? I that? believe the coaches getting the – the, in, the, the other players and their roles and what they're going to do. The, the, the player that I believe could be the, be the biggest story is Pasco Siakam. Mm-hmm. Man, he is a nightmare. I mean, shooting the three, taking it off the dribble, him defending, him and Kawhi on the defensive end. So I believe the rotations play a key. Who's going to get the shots? How the offenses are run? And Brett Brown's got to make a decision because they have said all year the offense goes through Joel and B for three quarters, and then Jimmy Butler's going to take over at the end. This playoffs has been nothing like that. What do they do in this series? So I believe that the coaching in playoffs, it becomes more than just managing people because, man, role players are role players for a reason. But if you put me in a role that I'm not comfortable with, I believe that coach that can find that comfort spot in, in those other players has a huge advantage. And we talk about Philly being having a short rotation. I think in this series it's going to get even shorter. I don't think Boban can play no. in this series. Not against the big men Toronto has. Because no. Mark Gasol can hit 18-footers. Serge Ibaka can hit 18-footers. And when Boban's out there, I mean, he is, he is good within, like you would say about Ben Simmons, within three feet of the basket. But that's on both ends of the court, offensive and defensive. So I think now all of a sudden your backup center is probably Probably unplayable Kendrick Perkins a la in the NBA Finals years ago. The the one other thing we haven't, I don't think, focused on enough is how good can Ben Simmons be in this series on both sides of the ball? Kyle Lowry cannot guard him. And I think it would be a misappropriation of resources. Hey, hey now, hey, I saw Jared Dudley guard Ben Simmons. Okay, right, but now. Jared, so here's the difference, though, <laughs> in, my, in my eyes. Ben Simmons, if Kyle Lowry's on him, he can go down, go to work in the post. He can just use his eight-inch height advantage on Kyle Lowry and his strength advantage in a way he doesn't have on Jared Dudley. So I, if Ben Simmons is the guy I think he should be, you can't have Kyle Lowry on him. Conversely, Ben Simmons should Kyle have Lowry, some. Kyle Lowry, I believe, is going to guard he's, he's a pit, and Kyle Lowry is a pit Yes, Bull. and going back home Philadelphia yes. where he played this college ball. That's going to be interesting, that Right, that, so that battle. My, yes. if Philly's going to have a real shot at pulling off the upset, Ben Simmons has to win that battle. And on the other end, Ben Simmons needs some minutes on Kawhi. Ben Simmons needs to be guarding Kawhi Leonard in critical stretches of this series. Now, I understand it ticks down. The question always is, so where do you put J.J. Redick? I get it. Like, whenever at some point, J.J. Redick's got to guard somebody. But Ben Simmons is one of the best, at times, perimeter defensive players in the league. And as long as Kawhi is, Ben Simmons is longer. If you can put Ben Simmons on Kawhi, use Jimmy Butler on Pascal Siakam, use Jimmy Butler elsewhere, then all of a sudden I think you have an edge for Philadelphia if Ben Simmons can have it. They're going to put Kawhi Leonard on Ben Simmons. That's going to be the matchup that this through this series because when they did that, he could barely dribble the ball up the floor. He wanted no part of it. Now, Chris Broussard is on with the Lock It In crew to discuss the 2019 NBA playoffs. Welcome back to Lock It In. I'm Rachel Bonetta, joined by Jason McIntyre, who is in for Todd Furman, Clay Travis, and Cousin Sal. I want to welcome in our resident basketball professor, FS1 pro basketball analyst, Chris Broussard. Chris, always good to have you on the show. So much basketball, so little time. We definitely have to dedicate like five minutes to Damian Lillard, so let's jump right into some round ball talk. (laughs) Let's start with tonight's NBA action. The Golden State Warriors look to wrap up their first round series with the clip show. The Dubs are favored by 14 and a half at home. Chris, do you think Golden State wins in a blowout tonight? 
Without question, this is going to be a route. You saw last night how when teams are down 3-1, Orlando, Brooklyn, try as they might, you just cannot muster up the energy to play your best basketball because you know the, the series is over. That's what's going to happen tonight. And let's just face it, through the first four games, but for a, a quarter and a half, this series has been all Golden State. They're just much better than the Clippers, and you're going to see it tonight. Sally, Sal, do you agree? I do agree. And you know what? A couple months ago, I told Chris that the Clippers are going to make the playoffs, and he, laughed. he scoffed at me. Give us your best scoff, Chris. He was like, ha, ha, ha. But here we are. I don't remember that. They are going to get beat. They are going to get beat. Hey, how about we have some fun? Minus 21 and a half is plus 265, Chris. Big blowout tonight, right? Yeah, it's going to be huge. Right. It's going to be huge. Uh, in tonight's other game, the Utah Jazz are trying to stay alive in Houston tonight. Uh, down 3-1 to one in that series. The Rockets are favored by 8.5 points. Chris? Do you think Donovan Mitchell and the Jazz can do enough to keep this one close? No, Donovan Mitchell has not solved his problems. I know he's averaged 30 points, two points a game in the last two games, but he still shot about 38%. And in Houston, he was much worse, averaged 15 points a game. The Rockets will shoot the ball much better at home, and they will close out the Jazz by a big number tonight. Uh, Clay of House Travis, can Utah keep this one close tonight? What do you think? Uh, I don't think they can. I think what you got is a situation where two big prize fighters have got a big fight set up, and before that, they got to take down the final tomato can. And so this is about the Rockets not wanting to give any advantage at all to the Warriors. It's also about the Warriors not going to want to give any advantage to the Rockets. Both these teams, I think, at home are going to come out, take care of business, wipe out their opponent on the same night, and get ready for what I think may well be the best series in the NBA playoffs. It just happens to be occurring in the semifinals of the Western Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, Chris, I don't know if you saw this last night, but that one guy, Damian Lillard, made a really nice basket at the end of the OKC versus Portland game. Chris, Dame Lillard has been playing out of his GD mind in these playoffs. Do you think Portland is worth betting to win the Western Conference at 14 to 1? With all due respect to the great Damian Lillard, they have absolutely no Come chance on. of reaching the NBA Finals. None. Don't bet. Don't waste your money. They have no chance. Look, Oklahoma City, despite their dominance of Portland in the regular season, was really a good matchup with them because, number one, outside of Westbrook and Paul George, no one else really stepped up to, to you know, play well when their duo was outplayed by Portland's duo of C.J. McCollum and Damian Lillard. If that happens in Golden State, say their backcourt outplays Steph and Clay. well, what are you going to do with Kevin Durant? And beyond that, Portland doesn't defend the three-point ball that well. No problem against OKC, which doesn't shoot it well. But against Golden State, you're in trouble when you don't defend the arc very well. Uh, yeah, I got to I got to agree, Rachel. Uh, first of all, I don't know that Portland's getting by Denver for sure. Assuming Denver puts away the Spurs, this Denver team has really shown a lot despite being a very young team. But I would agree with Chris. I'm not even sure they get a game off the Warriors the way this uh, Golden State team is. They have no matchup for Kevin Durant. Not that anybody does. So I think it's a waste of money, plus 1,400. Don't do it. Y'all are haters. Uh, let's keep it moving. Last night, the 76ers trounced the Nets to move on to the Eastern Conference semifinals, where they will take on the greatest and most beloved team in the history of organized sports, my Toronto Raptors. Chris, what's the most likely outcome in this series? Toronto win a sweep or <clears throat> Toronto win a sweep? As much as I hate to uh, boost up Rachel's prediction <laughs> oh! and, and swell up her head, I am going with the Raptors in six. All right, Philadelphia does not play smart basketball down the stretch. They got away with it against Brooklyn because they had such a, a talent discrepancy. They won't have that much of an advantage against Toronto as far as talent. And then you look at Joel Embiid had his way with Brooklyn. Mark Gasol will offer more resistance. Pascal Siakam or Kawhi Leonard, whichever one ends up at times, or Jimmy Butler or Ben Simmons will be able to make it tough on them. Toronto will win this series in six, possibly five. Ooh, take that, McIntyre. Sally, Sally, Ooh. your thoughts on my Toronto Raptors. What do you think? No, Chris did a good job. That was a nice present. I give him a C plus. Lights out. All right. <laughs> because I say Toronto. I'll remember that next time well, I've got <laughs> pin in my hand. <laughs> well, I, we pretty much have the same pick. I have Toronto in five. As you said, it could be six or five. Yeah, Kawhi averages 31 against this team. This team is dominant at home. They're 32 and nine at home. They're going to be, it's going to be demoralizing for Philly to be down two. And then they drop one in Philly and then lose in five. That's how it works. <laughs>
I don't know how I feel to have everybody on my side. It's quite nice. I don't know how long it'll last for. Uh, all right, in the other Eastern Conference semifinals, Kyrie Irving and the Celtics take on Giannis Antetokounmpo in the box. Milwaukee is minus 305. To win the series, Chris, what do you think is going to happen? Well, Rachel, rumor has it that a lot of people on this show are wearing leprechaun-colored glasses. <laughs> you better take them off, oh, all right? Because oh, Milwaukee boy. is winning this series in six games. They got the best player on the floor in Giannis Antetokounmpo. They're perfectly built for the analytics era. They got one guy in Giannis that you can't stop from getting out of the paint. It's impossible. And if you wall it off, double, triple team him at the rim, he kicks it out because he's surrounded by three-point shooters. They protect the rim with Brooke Lopez and Giannis. There is no way that they will be stopped. They will win this series in six, even though I like the Celtics a little bit. All right, uh, Clay, what's your prediction? It's almost like last year didn't even happen. The Celtics in seven is going to happen here. We've seen the Bucs have trouble winning on the road. I don't count winning on the road against the Pistons as legitimately winning on the road. When push <laughs> comes to shove and they get punched in the mouth a little bit, and I think it might happen in game one, and they lose one they're not expected, I think this young team could start to crumble. Ultimately, the Celtics are more veteran. They got the better coach, and they have the better overall roster top to bottom. I think the Celtics get it done in seven. All right. Uh, and finally, the Spurs lost game five to the Nuggets by 18 last night. The series shifts back to San Antonio tomorrow night for game six. Chris, do the Spurs have any shot at coming back and winning their series with Denver? Yeah, if there was a team I had to bet on to come back from down 3-2 without home court advantage, it would be a Greg Popovich coach team. I don't, I don't put anything past him as a coach. I don't think these guys are dead. I think they win game six for sure and then go to Denver and have a great chance to win game seven. All right, thanks, buddy. Coming up next, the guys will tell you the exact order of the top three picks in the NFL draft. Stay tuned. Following Skip and Shannon break down the Warriors' lackluster game five that resulted in a loss to the Clippers. Oh. What happened last night? Skip, they sent them dogs to the podium. You mm. see Pat Beverly, Trez, and, and Sweet Lou. <laughs> Sweet Lou to the rescue. Mm. Skip, what happened last night? The Warriors did look past them. They did not believe. They have a 3-1 lead. There's no way they can come back and beat us. Mm -hmm. And they came out, Skip, like, you know what? We're not going to play any defense. We're just going to get into a scoring match with these mm -hmm. guys. And they go jump out first quarter 41, and then something happened. Yep. They stopped making shots, and because they didn't play any defense, the Clippers kept making shots. Mm. So now what I thought, I was like, man, the Clippers, because remember, Skip, I said, it's going to be 107 to 90. Well, they got 71 points at the half. And Who had 71 points? The Clippers Thank had... Thank you. <laughs> you know... Not Golden State. No. no. Yeah. They, they allowed the Clippers to get into yeah. a rhythm. And <clears throat> once they got into that rhythm, they couldn't get them out of it. They got 57 points. They had uh, 59 total bench points. But they got 57 from uh, Montrez Harrell and Sweet Lou Williams. Mm. Skip, once he got it going, and Trez was unbelievable rolling to the rim. And when he rolls to the rim... Mm. He's dunking on your head, mm -hmm. or he's playing through you. He played through Draymond. He played through KD. He played through Bogut. And the problem they're probably going to run in, Skip, now that Boogie's out, Boogie could take Trez away from the basket. He can make him work on the defensive end. Mm -hmm. None of their other bigs can make him work. So he's a bundle of energy to begin with that he has to expend none of that on the defensive side of the basketball. So now we go back to the closer, Sweet Lou. Mm. Skip, he can get any shot he wants. He shoots the three really well. And his head, that up fake, Skip, he's dribbling the basketball. And he gets everybody with the same move. He's dribbling. And he gives him the up fake like he's about to rise for the jumper. And guess what? Ask KD about it. Mm. Ask Iggy. <laughs> Ask everybody about it. Ask me about it on Sunday afternoon. What, what, <laughs> what happened last Sunday? What happened? He what happened? Sweet. What did I come in here and pound the desk about on Monday morning? You what did I pound? You wanted Sweet Lou. Well, what did he do in the fourth quarter? It it's is. a one-point game, and Sweet Lou went completely it south on it me. He made up After for I it. talked about him being a potential Hall of Famer, Hold on, he just let me down. He went 0 for 5 in the fourth quarter uh, on Sunday. That, no, no. This series should be 3-2 to two Clippers. It should be. It was on a silver platter for Sweet Lou to do sweet things. You know what? Right? It, you know what? This, Am I right about that? You, you're right. Yes. But I think your hostility your, and you being a— I lost a case. That's what it's I had it. I had it. I called it. I said they're going to win game four. They won't be able to win game three, but they would win game four. And if they had closed the deal that was right there to be closed, we'd be having a very different conversation. But you, but you know we wouldn't. 
because the, the Golden State Warriors would have taken this game more serious. I, I disagree with that, but go ahead. But they're going to close. I believe they'll close it out, Skip. They underestimated. They underestimated the Clippers. And as you mentioned, Doc said this is the most resilient group he's ever coached. Ever. They, they are uh, that's that. A, that's a big statement. They got right. contributions from everybody. Patrick Beverly was unbelievable. Jermichael Green gave them quality minutes. Skip, I don't know what's going on with the Warriors. But you did you know that Klay Thompson has taken more shots than Steph? Mm. Steph is down to about 15 shots a game where he mm. was at 19 during the regular season. Mm. Now, I can understand a little bit because KD had it going. Mm. And when KD has it going, you don't want to interrupt that. It's kind of like what we saw the other night with Dame Lillard. He had it going. The other guys got mm -hmm. out of his way. But they better take the Clippers serious. Mm -hmm. The Clippers believe because they've already gone to Oracle, beaten them one time. Mm -hmm. They believe they can do it again. Sure. You don't be wanting to go back and skip nope, for a game. You, seven, don't, you do not want any you're an, part of that. You're an injury away yep. or, or, or a bounce, do, do, a ball falls in mm -hmm. from going home. Yep. But I believe they'll take care of business on when they play Friday night. Yeah, I'll be able to take care of business. I'm not so sure about that. Really? I'm feeling a game seven in this series, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I saw a little different game than you saw last night. I saw a strange and amazing thing happen at Oracle Arena. You can write off what happened in game two as a fluke, as an aberration. They were 31 points down and they came back because Golden State took their foot off the gas yeah. and they couldn't quite push the accelerator back down until it was too late. Right. I'll give you fluke in game two. Last night was anything but a fluke because the Clippers beat Golden State playing a good game at home. Golden State played a good basketball game last night. Golden State made 15 three-point shots. Isn't that usually the recipe for disaster for the visiting team at yes. Oracle? 15, yes. by the way, Golden State hit eight of 10 threes in the first quarter. Yeah. What usually happens to the poor road foe if you, you give up eight threes to that team in that building? Right. It's over. That's when the Clippers should have said, we give up. We're home for the holidays. You know, we're on vacation, yep. right? Yep. They, they should have just said, we're not worthy. We're done. Thank you very much. But Golden State let them get six. Okay. They, okay. they just deep. kept right on keeping right. on and matching shot for shot. Yes. So they beat them head to head with the Warriors playing a pretty good, if not very good game at their house, right? Right. So... Again, I'm going to reiterate that, that quote. Doc said, most resilient team I have ever coached. Mm -hmm. And to his point, Golden State roared all the way back in the fourth quarter and, and got all the way at, two, four, at the 240 mark. Kevin Durant dunked yeah. and put them ahead by one point, 118 to 117. Wouldn't that be a no-moss moment? Wouldn't that be game over? For I, I thought it was game okay. over at that point. Okay, and what happened? My man, Sweet Lou, came right down <laughs> and bombed a three. But not only that, Kevin hit him, hit him on the hand and fouled him, and it became a four-point play to put them back up three points. Right. Then what happened on the other end? We're seeing that shot right now. Boom. Plus and one. Oh, wow. Kevin Durant. Interesting. There you go. Seven-foot monster. Best player so here the they planet. come right down here and – your man, Steph Curry, dribbled right into a turnover. What do I always say about Steph? Bigger the moment, the smaller he plays. He dribbled right in. That's a huge turnover yeah. mm -hmm. because is. they come right back to the other end. And this is Steph. Here we come back to the other end. Watch this shot by Lou Williams. Right in the face of Kevin Durant, a runner up off the glass. That's in the face of a seven-foot monster. You see how he creates Look at this. He, he bumped it for a little. Yeah. That's how he creates the space. But, but again, that was the dagger to yeah. me. That's where you say, wait a second. They got us. Yeah. They just shot us right in the stomach, right? And then he comes back on the shoot, oh. hits a 20 footer oh. on the left oh. perimeter. Oh. When he made that, the, the runner shot up off the glass, yeah. I said, that, that's just too good. It so was. I'm going to say what I said again. Should be three to two Clippers because they should have won that game on Sunday. Sunday. That's Lou's house. That's sweet Lou. That is the greatest score off the bench in the history of this yeah. league. And again, special. In, on Sunday, he went 0 for 5 in the fourth quarter. And I told you at the end of the show yesterday, he owes his team. And he paid them back last night because that's 33 points on 12 and 19. Do you realize he had 10 assists last night? Mm -hmm. Lou Williams had 10 assists in this game. Do you, do Seven of them was the, tra the trades. 
Yeah. <laughs> Dunk okay. it down right. the lane. Do you realize Patrick Beverly, who played his tail off again mm -hmm. last night, do you realize he had 14 rebounds? I do. That's Westbrook-esque, right? Yes. And do you realize they finally got Gallinari go going a little bit? He was only three for 11 from three, but at least he scored some points. He scored 26 and started making some shots. And, and Skip, that was the, the thing was, is that normally when they go eight of 10 in the first quarter from three, yep. that means they're going to end up somewhere in, in the 40s. Yep. But the opposing team is going to be somewhere in the 20s. Well, because they weren't playing in the D, and Patrick Beverly and those guys was kind of matching yep. them because they were six of what? Six, I think six of fifteen. Six of fifteen mm -hmm. yep. from the three in the first quarter. Yep. So now not bad. You yeah. only you only yeah. what plus six yep. in the, from the three point range mm -hmm. where you're normally you make eight threes in the first quarter. You're normally more than plus six. Yep. So Doc Rivers said after the game, that's the first time in this series we have been us. It's the first Clipper game in this series where they actually played a good game mm -hmm. from start to finish. They did. Obviously, when you get behind by 31, that's not a good game. Yeah. So he's making the point that maybe we sort of found ourselves. They, they've been nothing but confident. They're not afraid of this team no, at all. Not. No, they're not. Because this team, again, to, you brought it up earlier, and I brought it up all year long, this team lost a total of eight games mm -hmm. by 20-plus points, and six of those games were at home. And two of those home games were by 35 to Dallas and 33 to Boston. That, that's such, I, I told you, that's like not red flags. That's like neon, blinking red, danger, danger, danger. Right. Something's wrong with that. Golden State plummeted this year in, in defense. They were 10th in defensive efficiency. They were 16th in points allowed. Defense still wins championships right. in this league. And when they've been winning, when they've won the last two, they were one of the best defensive teams in the league. They are not anymore. They're not, they're not playing the same style of basketball. But, Skip, I believe the Warriors do not believe that the Clippers can actually beat them. Yeah, you won a game. Yeah, you won a game or two. But can you beat us four times in two mm -hmm. weeks? Now, there's good, it's the best of two. Now, yeah. we're about to find out. Yeah. But, Skip, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Mm. Draymond's playing terrible. Mm. He's shooting w in what? I, I don't think it's an elephant because I don't think he's been very good all year. No, honestly. and and the t he could have easily gotten tossed last night. He got yeah. the one tech skip and he wouldn't let it go. That he was actually the signature moment of this game because Patrick Beverly lost his shoe yeah. and mm -hmm. held it in his hand and drew a, a, charge, a charge from Draymond who tried to step over him yeah, again. And got another technical foul. If we can see this, unnecessary. Here we go. Here we go, lost shoe. I mean, Ooh, boom. I mean, what did... Uh, oh, now you're going to step over him? Really? Okay. Okay, yeah, good luck no. with that. Yeah. And you're teed up again. See? <sighs> Dre, I got to take the motion out the game, bro. Mm -hmm. And, well. I mean, hit... They're like basically on offense, Skip. They're playing four and five. Mm. They just leave Draymond open. They're like, you can't make a three. Mm. We're just going to leave you open. As long as you don't get a putback or anything like that, that's it. It's, it's bad. He, he's playing really bad. And maybe he's lost his confidence. Because, Skip, you remember game seven that he played against the Cavs. He was 32, 15, and nine. Mm -hmm. He would have been, I believe he would have been MVP had they won the series because he was that special in the series. Now, maybe the, uh, the voters would have taken it away from him, Skip, because he did get suspended mm -hmm. for the act what he did against LeBron because it was totally unnecessary, yep. you know, but it didn't cost him. Mm -hmm. Anyway, as I was saying, I believe the Warriors do not fear the Clippers. Like you nor, said. You nor do the Clippers fear the Warriors. No question about that. You know what? I don't see any reason why the Clippers shouldn't win game six at home. I don't see any reason why not, that, that they should win. Sure. And for the Clippers to win a game on the road when Kevin Durant gives you that virtuoso, mm -hmm. how do you how do you over <laughs> because Skip, he was spec, he was spec. Spectacular. I was like, oh, we're gonna we about to get another Dane performance. Mm. Cause he had it going. And when he gets it going, yeah. it's a thing of beauty. So true. Mm. But they was like, nah, we're not going anywhere. In the fourth quarter, he missed seven yeah. shots, four of eleven. I'm not sure that was a thing of beauty. Whoa, 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 whoa. Really? Yeah. The best I know the best player in the on the planet did not miss. Wait, you just changed your tune. No, you did stream. You no, you said that's tune. you. That's what you, you said. You, you were saying I was trying to correct you no. because I'm objective about my people. First of all. And you're not a, at all objective. Yeah. And so you're making the case it was a virtuoso it performance was. and he it's shot four high. of eleven. So hold on. And hold on. But he was 14 or 26. Mm. 12 or 12 for the free throw line. You say you like that. Money time. And, and he had only one turnover. Mm. 
Okay. Oh, come on, Skip. He's the best player on the planet. We know that. No, we don't know that. But I, he's on a troubled basketball team because that Draymond versus KD, the B-word situation, yeah. that's still simmering under the surface. You know that. This team's running out of psychological gas. This team is not playing defense. This team is in jeopardy of facing a Game 7 against the Clippers while the Rockets are resting. Right. Yeah. And a game seven at Oracle is dicey to me because the Clippers would go in there with nothing to lose. And I, the statement we just saw Clay make, I thought that was a dangerous thing for him to say about game six. He said, we should go win it by 30. That's who we are. That's right. what we do. Well, Doc's going to replay that in, in the Clippers locker room. Yeah. Finally, Vincent Goodwill is back with Nick and Cece to discuss Dame Lillard's big time shot and what's next for OKC. So the Portland Trailblazers now one step closer to taking this baby home right here. Vinny, how incredible was the moment and the game for Damian Lillard? I mean, I think I saw a list last night like at 3 a.m. because I couldn't go to sleep afterwards. And there's like six walk off series game winners in yep. NBA history. And Lillard has like two of them. He has two of them. Michael Jordan has one. Ralph Sampson has one. There's a couple others. Michael Jordan has two. Lillard oh, so he has, has two. two. He has Ralph two. Sampson has one. John Stockton has one. That's the full list. It, and in all the years of the NBA, and we're like a couple years from 75 to have that short of a list, and for you to have two of those in a five-year span, like to mm. me, being in that market, being in the age of super team, saying I'm not going to go to a super team. I'm going to have whatever it mm. is that's here. Yeah. Stay here with me, being an Oakland kid, being a guy who had to deal with Russell Westbrook, say, I've been, you know, lighting you up for years, and him to come out in this series and put Russ out. Mano y mano, like, there's nothing better than that because as point guards, it's just you and that other guy on the island, and he took it to Russ all series. And in a year that in college basketball, Virginia redeems what happened the year before. Yeah. Losing to a 16 seed, the comeback to win the whole thing. Damian Lillard last year, up to the moment the playoffs started, that was the pinnacle of his basketball career. First team All-NBA. His team gets home court advantage in the first round post LaMarcus Aldridge, something they had not been able to do, and they get swept out of the playoffs by a Boogie Cousins-less New Orleans Pelicans team. Ray John Rondo, old man Rondo, outplays him. He shoots 35% from the field in that series. Can't take advantage of his backcourt mate, CJ, playing great. They get swept. To come back the next series, outplay Russell mm -hmm. Westbrook in four of the five games, and to finish with this, score 50 in a playoff game, Kareem never did it. Your guy Isaiah Thomas never did it. That Isaiah, little Isaiah Thomas actually amazingly did it. Uh, Shaq never did it. LeBron hadn't done it ever until last year in the finals. Like, 50 in a playoff game is special. A game winner, series winner, you said it. Happened six times ever. Only four people ever have done it. He's now done it twice. It is. It was a spectacular game with an unbelievable finish from a guy who just keeps elevating himself in the NBA hierarchy. I mean, it was a remarkable shot. Even look at this photo right here. As far as Paul George with his limp, he's got his hand right over his eyes, and Dame still knocks it down from 37. So I think that you have to think about Damian Lillard and the time for which he's playing basketball. He's got two of these iconic shots already, and he's playing in an era in the Western Conference where Steph, a point guard, has been MVP. Chris Paul has been dominant for a decade. Russ has been MVP. Harden has emerged now playing point guard <laughs> as an in MVP. I mean, look at the point guards just in the Western Conference. Yeah. And to say that Damian's career has been underrated where he's playing at in that smaller market mm -hmm. in Portland, them not having success in the playoffs. Man, I'm glad that if there was a guy to be able to hit a shot or go through something like this, I'm glad it's him because he has really deserved it. Unfortunate bad luck late in the season. They lose their starting center. So this playoff, they already had a built-in excuse. As Bill Parcells says, man, you already got the back door already open. You got an injury. Man, you can go on out the back door. People won't even care. But, man, in this series and in that head-to-head -head with Russ, a guy who's been a nemesis of his build, knocked down that shot, this will not be forgotten in NBA lore for a long time. You know what I think about? I think about two things, and, and I'll give your boy LeBron some credit here. That moment almost struck me. Remember LeBron, his first playoff appearance against the Wizards? He walked up to Gilbert Arenas, patted him on the chest, and said, if you miss this free throw, you're going home. And that's exactly what he did. The audacity to take a 37-footer, 
with the time expiring. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. It's not a win or go home situation like Jordan against the Cavs. But 37 if, feet. If you miss, you don't lose. You go to overtime. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Just the audacity to take that shot against maybe the, the defensive player of the year in Paul George and send them home. If there's home. one guy that you want defending a 37 yep. for it's Paul. And Damian, he analyzed it. That was going to be his best shot. Yep. Well, because once he drove into the lane, because Paul has such length and the time and what's on the line, he's going to be able to bump him. They, listen, I thought they executed the final two possessions brilliantly. They got the two for one mm-hmm. perfectly, yes. mm-hmm. which without getting the two for one, OKC's holding for the last shot, right? Like So without getting the – or OKC has the opportunity if you don't make the previous shot. So they get the two for one. And then Dame, I think, was evaluating this. I don't mind if we go to overtime. We are playing better. We are on a run. I've been the best player this whole series. So what I'm not going to allow for is I get in the lane, somebody comes to flex the ball, they get the last shot. There's an offensive foul on a pick. I get swallowed up when they don't call a foul late in the game. I'm just going to take this 37-footer. And Rachel Nichols tweeted this out. It's crazy. In the playoffs, Dame is 8 of 12 on 30-footers. The rest of the NBA is 6 of 38. So, like, he's been hit. He hit the first shot of this series yep. was a 30-footer, and the last shot of this series was a 37-footer. And to think about this, guys, the p- teams often take on the personality of their best player, right? Yes. When they mm-hmm. went down double digits late in that fourth quarter, there was no panic. There was no scare. Yeah, that's there true. was some calm. Yes. They methodically came back while Oklahoma City unraveled. And if you're mm-hmm. going to say that one is an indictment of Russell Westbrook, you've got to say that Portland even – Even if you take the shot out of it, just their poise down the stretch. I think Portland's going to the Western Conference Finals, and I don't think it's going to be easy for Golden State or Houston to get out. Thank you for listening to the Hoops on Fox podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review, letting us know what you think of the show.